Cities everywhere are social causes for the societies in which they grow around. They serve as shapers and mirrors of the nation's culture, politics, and social attitudes. Cities also play an important role in adding proportion and concentration of a nation's manufacturing capacity, productive outputs, tangible and intangible assets, and labor capital, all in a small space. Cities, because of their situ situation as centers of power, innovation, technology, and economic stamina, serve as an important catalyst for personal as well as communal perceptions, and therefore social interactions through the organization of its built environment and infrastructure. All that being said, Lucas and I have been working this past term with the Jackson Square Archives at the library, um, and we have been working on drawing connections between community involvement and infrastructure within the city, specifically Jackson Square. We've been looking at modern architecture and its impact on community, and we'd like to share some of what we've found with you. So hello, I'm Lucas Muscato Garboni, as you've already introduced. Um, after the Second World War, Hamilton began to decline. Uh, due to many like, factors that we see like in the post-war uh, like, scenario and system that was like, put into place, we start to see a decline of many urban cores. Unfortunately, because um, we see for two decades like, the Depression and the Second World War had drained resources and put them towards um, either like, supporting the industrial complex for like, uh, the, the wartime period, Afterwards, people who had for about 15 years at this time experienced a period of like long depression, of um, like not an ability to socially move upward. The spirit like that embodied the consciousness of the Western world after the war was to embrace something completely new. And that, as what like, we know today, was known as modernism. Modernism embodied the spirit of progress and technological advancement, inherited from the Enlightenment, and was reflected in a variety of late 19th century and 20th century cultural movements. Modernist architecture developed in Europe after the First World War, and as a part of an effort to build affordable housing, grew into an international style, and championed the Congress International de Architecture Moderne. Rejecting the 19th century historicism, modernist architects favored clean, straight lines, and used concrete and steel to create buildings without ornamentation. Often believing that their buildings would bring about a positive change, modernism planners aspired to create functional cities where efficient transportation corridors could move traffic quickly between distinct zones, one for industrial, one for commercial, and one for housing. Hamilton's politicians and downtown businessmen felt their city was being held back by its old buildings and looked forward to a complete modernist makeover for the downtown. Previous facelifts to the stores and banks along Hamilton's King Street West had usually involved a fresh coat of paint or new cladding for the existing buildings, but this one would involve removing the bones as well as the skin. Demolition experts would clear 43 acres of downtown core to create a large civic square, and King Street West, one of Hamilton's two main arteries running through the middle of it. The scalpel, in reality, which was more of a wrecking ball, began to tear buildings down in January of 1969. Bricks, stone walls, cornices, and Victorian dormers began to fall before the city had finalized its plans for transformation and before it had even secured the necessary financing to complete the original scheme. Photographs show how King Street looked prior to urban renewal raising. And these photographs show that like, it was small to medium like build storefronts which had apartments on top or offices on top and which were like, facing street level and had, like, were, like, were grown out of this idea to create a sense of community amongst the people. But all of this soon was, was going to change. In April of 1965, Planner Murray Jones, after working with like, then Mayor Roy D. Jackson, presented his plan for the Civic Square. Under his plan, King Street would travel from one way west between Bay and James, cutting across new streets that float around axial pools and through open space in the front of a department store, which at the time was Eaton's, and an office building to the north, and a library and parking garage to the south. The familiar older buildings would all be torn down and open spaces left behind were said to be like that were said to be vital to the project because they would allow fresh air to circulate in the core. We can see this idea which was happened in the Aunt Hamilton Urban Renewal Program of 1958, of which everything like, was to be demolished because it was said to be causing health issues. Um, so then there's a huge emphasis placed on opening space up for air because without like, the freshness of air disease was, like, was to be spread. Which interestingly enough is an idea that was born out of Victorian like, um, early medicine practices, and yet it's somehow wanting to modernize the city. We're still holding on to the, like, these Victorian ideals. 
so which I find that very interesting and hypocritical. In June of 1968, the King Street merchants and tenants were told they had six months to vacate their buildings. And although the 1965 plan of urban renewal was well known, the timing for the destruction had changed so often that the occupants were surprised that they had to go at all. So we see with from 1959 onwards to 1969 that this plan had constantly changed. They were being told like a one second that they would be kicked out in six months, then they were told that like, they were like, supposed to replan, then they were told that their rents would be raised and that certain, like, certain buildings would go and certain buildings would not. But eventually, by January of 1969, they, like, they were terminated all the leases. The stores and residents would have to go, and the filthy black lanes and grubby rooftops and decrepit faces of the second and third floors, as the spectator reported, would have to be replaced. Concrete would replace the stone facades, and Hamilton would be able to stand proud as it approached the 125th anniversary of its incorporation as a city. Knowing that it would finally look modern, a term used by politicians and commenters to signify the new and up-to-date style. Since the 1950s, Hamilton, like councillors, politicians, and business people, had linked downtown like relevant to the coal becoming modern and up-to-date and being able to compete with Toronto and to the east, Buffalo. The ambitious city was determined to update its look to reflect an industrial powerhouse. The modernist look at the it saw the skewed historical connections. The solid old buildings, some made of stone held by Hamilton's earliest citizens, were no longer valued. Smooth edges of steel and glass represented the new machine look, which is to represent an industrial city where machines had dominated. In addition, the notion that something had to be done quickly was the pride of Hamilton's felt in accomplishing something really big. They had been labeled the ambitious city, and therefore their project had to be ambitious and just as swift as their attitude. The Civic Square Urban Renewal Select Scheme was said to be the largest downtown urban renewal land assembly project in Canada, and it was. The city believed that in doing something that would have a profound effect on the downtown urban renewal throughout the country, and therefore the city developer would have to work well together with dedication to the sincere objectives of the program. Unfortunately, Hamilton chose a developer with an inferior physical layout, and its original 1960, like 1965 plan was completely abandoned and taken over by Yale Properties of Montreal in 1968. Working in two, like, for two years, they were like promised the city to increase its commercial components and its ability to generate revenue, capital, and taxes by 50%, something that the original plan was unable to do. King Street West would no longer cross a square of gardens and pools, and the street was no longer a part of a grand vision for a square. Instead, it became a transportation corridor where the flow of traffic cut through two super blocks and overhead um, went, well, like walkways across the large streets. The six buildings now combined to the south side were to have like, high walls of concrete and King Street West was to become divorced from pedestrian life. As the public part of the square shrank, the commercial interest increased. The automobile was the only winner in this situation. With roots in European industrial architecture and social housing, straight modernist lines were easy and cheap to replicate in steel and concrete, and therefore these were the, like, the preferred systems used. So although modernism was an idea like, which favored functionalism and like, geometric designs alongside with glass, which would like open up, or at least if it wouldn't open up to the street, it would be, like, allow you to view the street. In this case, because like, we see like, the like, Main Street and King Street become two corridors of, flowing, like, of opposing flowing traffic, they wanted like, the car to win, and therefore opening up to the street would have like, created like, a sense of community and would not have been considered modern. So therefore, we see high walls of concrete and like, absolutely no windows, which wouldn't be added until the mid-1990s. The city would rely on the modernist machine aesthetic of efficient straight lines and mon like monotonous concrete design to, strand, to, like, to transform King Street West from a street where people had window shop to a street where traffic flowed. This idea was also like, birthed out of the fact that at the time we see the Soviet uh, like, Union at its height, and because they had built the Autobahn and like, had many like, streets which were converted to one way, there was a fear amongst like, city um, like, officials and like regional officials and like even like federal like officials on like on all levels of government that if we did not um, like focus on the ability to transport people from like very quickly amongst like lines which only moved in one direction that the, in, in essence the Soviets would be able to like boost their economy faster and support like their like industrial output like for longer periods of time and therefore we would fail and eventually be taken over. Two like, two like super blocks would be created on either side of King Street West. McNabb would stop at King, and its north section lost to large steel and the glass Stalo Tower. Park and Charles Street, which were like the original streets it, like, located within like the 42 acres that were like demolished, would be like completely like disappear forever from history. 
This allowed architects to design their buildings unhindered by roads, as well as allowing traffic to flow one way along King without the interruption of stop signs and intersections. The superblocks also decreased the opportunity for human encounters on the street, and therefore we see that the idea of individualism reigns like strong. As Marshall Berman had written, our culture once celebrated the street. It was experienced as the medium in which the totality of modern material and spiritual forces could meet, clash, and work out their ultimate meanings and fates. When the automobile was permitted to dominate the agenda, the families of eyes get poked out, and the, like the de sorry, I cannot pronounce that word, the, like the democratizing forces at play, which were like associated with the community that we see in Victorian architecture disappeared. By allowing for many different ways of traveling through the downtown, more connections are created. But when a major road becomes like the one-way traffic corridor, dominated by like tall buildings of concrete and very little glass, there become, like, there's like, limited access and the intricate like, connections between people and like, that are created through small shops are disappeared entirely. The modernist planners wanted to separate the car from the, like, from the pedestrian. And when the plans like, were redrawn to replace the civic squares, pools, and gardens with more commercial properties, the planners decided to elevate the pedestrians above the street level. And the only reason why this was done was because like, citizens, including the Hamilton downtown like, BIA, had protested against like, um, like these long like, buildings. And, and like, because they were promised civic space, had demanded it. So in essence, the civic space was taken away from the street, put on top of the building, and became isolated with no like, um, inclusive access for those with disabilities. Also, a skywalk system similar to what exists in Calgary and Alberta was like, used heavily um, like in this case as well. They wanted to draw people away from the street as much as possible and put them into the sky. Not only like, did this allow traffic to flow like, easily for cars, but this was also like, part of a modernist dream which like, favored futurism and the ability to put Hamilton like, into like, the future and this like, sci-fi dream, which dominated the 1960s and 70s. The supposed green space on the roof of the enclosed shopping mall, which is now known as Jackson Square at this point, is paved and eerily empty. The elevated paved plaza is accessible from King Street West, but barely used by stairs. Along the windswept and diminished sidewalks of the old street, instead of the empty urban rooftop where one feels very alone. In order for the system to work, you need a critical mass, and that critical mass is never materialized for various reasons, including a low population, no access to like transportation systems, and of course, like the decline that we see later, starting in the mid 80s. When the, de like, the demolitions began on King Street West, the planners and urban renewal authorities complained of restrictions to their vision. Representatives of the Hamilton Downtown Association demanded that urban renewal be seen as a system and not as a plan. They didn't want to be constrained by the approached plan, but wanted the freedom to continue to destroy and rebuild like, their modern city, which they pegged as a humanoid project, but in reality was only to increase capital. To this day, many people, again, like, the original architects which designed the building, blame the uh, hippie anti ecolic intellectualism for stopping planners from continuing with urban renewal development. So once we see civic backlash like appear, like the uh, original architects and city planners of the time, um, like backlash by like pitting these people who wanted civic space as hippies and um, as people who didn't want to see progress or growth for their city. We see uh, like urban renewal in this case as a, like a systematic plan to demolish and to rebuild, rather than looking at the small individual connections which are constrained in like the need to build like a sense of community and for any like sort of system or plan to work. The facelift that brought the buildings and erased three cross streets was hastily completed, and the city's politicians grasped by inexpensive modernist solutions to replace the void that was left behind by the once enthusiastic destruction that was complete. The section of King Street West lost its like material diversity and its connection to the past. The aesthetic was transferred from the beauty that contained an individual buildings and was transferred to the efficient movement where machine speed was adopted to represent the city's status and its future. And the slow pedestrian was discouraged from the street. The aesthetic embraced the idea of a system imposed from above by the government money and urban planner's grandiose vision. The section of King Street West between James and Bay was transformed from a destination where pedestrians strolled and shopped to a wide through fair where the automobile had priority.
The planning sketches for motivation behind all the destruction for the original square showcasing the gardens and elegantly placed civic buildings do a better job of explaining why urban planning renewal caught Hamilton's imagination. After years of hearing how the downtown was repeat, with slum-like derelict buildings, urban renewal funds offered Hamilton's a chance to dream of greening the core with beautiful pools and gardens, making the downtown reflect the pride they felt for their city. Unfortunately, the dreams had no room for legacy of the past, and the clean sweep of the redevelopment area left no remainders of pedestrian-friendly streets. Hamiltonians wanted to beautify their city, and the initial scheme responded to their aspirations. But these plans, like many urban renewal schemes that we see in the middle of the 20th century, looked better on paper and needed more funds than the ambitious city could raise. Hamilton had latched on to a misconceived solution to its perceived problem and then compounded the outcome with poorly executing renewal. And once the buildings were torn down, the politicians were forced to disregard the original plans, which had dotted their desks. These, like all factors, although caused initial success for Jackson Square, by the mid-80s had led it to its full-on decline, including many like systems at play, including the introduction of fast fashion stores, like we see today, such as H&M and Forever 21, the introduction to Walmart as a main department store into Canada in 1994, and also like the loss of Hamilton's like, with, like, industrial base. Therefore, by creating a plan which causes simple through fares of movement from the industrial core to the commercial core, like in downtown, and then outwards to the outlying like housing like districts. By supporting like this system, once one of them failed, which was the industrial base, the rest of them went with it. Unfortunately, today Jackson Square still remains a hot topic and like derelict as like as it was like, like planned to be and protest against by the original citizens. That being said, there have been many like, systems and factors at play which are leading to its success. And these include like, incorporating the idea of community and fundamental connection and social interactions between people. And my partner, Julia, will continue to explain that. Thank you. OK, so Luke spoke of um, a critical mass and how we don't have a critical mass at Jackson. And there's some exciting news um, that I'm sure we've all heard of, but I'm going to go over it anyway before I talk about kind of what we would like to implement at Jackson, idealistically. Um, so McMaster's downtown center uh, has resided in the city-owned courthouse on 50 Main Street East for the past 13 years. Um, but as of recent, just the past few months, it's been confirmed that McMaster will be moving into Jackson, occupying 50,000 square feet. Uh, the critical mass that we're hoping for may be um, actualized and realized with McMaster's move to Jackson, as 200 staff members and 4,000 students will be circulating through the building. Um, we've spoke about it quite a bit, and we feel that as a university, uh, McMaster has kind of a reputation to uphold within the community, and we feel that it should foster community and, and stretch beyond our building and our boundaries. So we feel that moving to Jackson is extremely positive for the community, and we feel that um, it gives us as students a great opportunity to experience another part of Hamilton, a building that is the heart of the city. It's, it's really important, and we feel like um, moving to Jackson can only bring positive developments. Um, with that being said, uh, another development has come recently. It's still under speculation, but um, the <coughs> civic center, um, the civic center has been purchased, um, and what's kind of been been in the runnings right now is bowling alley and a bar. Uh, the new owner wants to bring family to Jackson. Um, they're looking at entertainment. So, with that being said. Um, Obviously, places like bowling alleys and restaurants, they can foster community, um, and I think we need to build upon that. Um, I think what Jackson is lacking is that sense of community. Um, the walls that have been put up, as Luke said, have been closed off from street level. Pedestrians have been forced on the roof or underground, um, inside the building itself, and it's a bit dark. Um, and so we would like to share with you kind of some of the ideas that we've had for um, renewing Jackson. Uh, we've been working alongside the students doing the Greenwall project. We've been collaborating with them and listening to their ideas, and we've been very inspired by it. Um, I myself uh, really like the idea of a garden as fostering growth in the community and bringing people together. 
Um, I feel like right now, if you've ever been up on the roof of Jackson, you know that it's completely empty. You might see a few people on their breaks uh, having coffee or going out for a cigarette, but other than that, it's just a plain empty roof. Um, and I feel like we can utilize that space. Not only should we be utilizing the empty space within the building by moving in places like with Master and adding things, possibly a bowling alley, but for the roof itself is important. Because what we found in our research when we were looking at the archives is that when the initial plans for Jackson were proposed, everyone in the city was extremely pleased. Well, not everyone, but the majority were pleased. Uh, because it was talking about pools and gardens and the space to walk around, not only inside the building, but especially outside of the building. And that was never actualized. So what I would like to propose as my pipe dream uh, is using the roof as um, a space for possibly a park, um, gardens, and maybe a playground. I want to see um, people engaging above ground as well as below ground. Um, and I think that uh, the green wall, as you'll hear more of uh, in a few moments, um, it, a garden is a perfect opportunity to um, improve the environment while bringing the community together, and that's what I'd like to see at Jackson. Um, we have uh, also been speaking about places like James North and Lock Street, and their recent success, especially with the students here. Um, everyone writes and writes about how great Lock is and James North, and they're known for things like Art Crawl, Super Crawl, um, the Lock Street Festival, and Battle Dish. So those are all events that people can go to um, for free if they'd like, and they can participate, and they can go and look around uh, Hamilton and explore. And uh, for students, I think it's important because um, they can get out of campus if they're living on campus. And they can go and experience the city. And a lot of people are a little bit hesitant to do this. Um, they feel that Hamilton just isn't a place they want to explore. They don't feel safe. But I think that places like James North and Lock Street, when they hold community events, it allows students to, to go out and say, oh, I like this place, I'd like to be involved. Um, and so experiential learning, like the Greenwall Group and, and like Lewis and, me, and I doing um, research, it allows us to um, use our education to further the community and to speculate how we can make a difference within the community. And um, again, our Call Super Girl, Battle Dish, Lock Street Festival are all bringing people together in the community. Um, and so I think that if we transform the rooftop of Jackson, um, not only to just being a green space where people can go and enjoy themselves daily, but possibly somewhere where events can be held. Um, in the past, there have been concerts that were held on the roof when Jackson was in its um, initial stages and it was being fairly successful. Uh, we saw concerts held on the roof and people would go and enjoy music. I think if we can bring back um, things like that, not only, not only bringing in um, new stores and new commercial investment, but also new opportunities for the community to go and just have fun aside from shopping. Uh, places like the library and the farmer's market offer this to us already. Um, and I know that the only times I go to Jackson, it's usually not to shop, it's to go to the farmer's market or to the library. And after I'm done there, I'll wander into Jackson as a result. So I think that if we have um, a park, people may go to play with their kids or to just have a good walk around um, because there aren't really very many spaces like that available right now downtown. We have Gore Park, but it's, it's a fountain and it's in the middle of busy roads and um, people do go and they do enjoy themselves, but if we can have somewhere that has more green space to offer, more grass and more landscape, I think that will attract people. Um, and I think that as a result of offering this new green space, people will wander into Jackson and it can only benefit. I don't think it can harm at all. And that's what I would like to see. Um, I'm going to pass, pass the mic over to Luke again. He's going to speak about some things he would like to see at Jackson. Okay, so thank you very much, Julia. Um, applying like peace studies theory here, up until the 1980s, like the prevailing like peace like kind conflict theory was conflict resolution, which basically, in in the most like basic like, form I can give it to you, would uh, be coming in and completely like re like revamping something, demolishing like um like like the old and bringing in like a new idea in order to transform the future. And as you've seen, like all that does is cause um more like and further like destruction and in this case can actually cause an entire system and like an entire city to, to really grind to a halt. So applying like the new uh, conflict theory which is conflict uh, transformation 
um, instead of like demolishing the square and entirely rebuilding it, or you know, like or just entirely like revamping it, we want to like like manage it like in, in a way where it can foster community, and then the community can help it like in its ability to rebuild itself. So, um, and so, like in the cases that, that we looked at, since we can't like entirely get rid of all the walls, and like since money was in it, like was a huge factor here, and since we are uh, like the city isn't dead, um, the idea like would be to add in uh, like more glass and to uh, like open up like certain like more street like uh, entrances and like more street like windows and like to brighten up like the cavernous feel like which happens inside the square if you ever like walk through it. And like, what that will do, since uh, it'll add like a sense of community. And, and it'll like help foster like the ability for people to come together to invest and to feel like a sense of pride, which it does and has shown to, if you look at like Lock Street and James Street North, attract like uh, commercial attention and bring in capital to revamp it. So, looking um, like at these projects, which are like prevalent in Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, and a little bit in Vancouver, um, like we notice like the, these projects are successful there, but why? But why isn't it successful here? Um, one of the core like um, reasons, um, which was brought up by like, the architect in what I had read to you, was that critical mass. That keyword, critical mass. Hamilton, unfortunately, is a city of 500,000 people and doesn't have millions of like you know business workers and people constantly coming in like Toronto does to constantly like fuel like the business which happens in these underground like path system, these underground shopping malls and commercial districts. And it also doesn't have an underground transportation system which connects straight to like these businesses to help like, bring a constant flow of people. So, in that case, what we need to do is in like uh, like with our like, population size is to open like it up to community space by like allowing community space to happen at street level. Now that doesn't mean completely abandoning the square that like, happens at the roof. Um, what that also means is like incorporating like that rooftop space and by like trying to bring it to the street by creating more like, entrances by uh, making it more friendly and putting in elevators to make it inclusive and like, accessible for people with disabilities, which we noticed was a huge problem in the initial development of the square up until the middle of the like, um, like 1980s, where there was like huge protests from like um, Hamilton disabled groups because it was not wheelchair accessible. So, making it inclusive, opening it up, bringing in like um, a fresh, like a, a, a sorry, breath of fresh air, and uh, like more like outdoor light, and an ability for people to feel like this is an, like an open space, even though it's not, which will help like bring in people and therefore investment. Thank you very much. And that's the end of the presentation. Does anyone have a quick question for them about the you know, what happened? Yes. Uh, this is that idea. Of, uh, I'm a resident of Hamilton for the past few years before uh, I started master. That idea is to put the green space on top of um, that square. That's a phenomenal idea. And I, I hope you guys uh, are able to talk to the right people and try to see if you get that on the table. That's a fantastic Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're excited um, about that possibility. Right now, it's just a pipe dream. So as you can hear with uh, the people doing the green wall, um, it sort of is a pipe dream as well. And you kind of have to have the right people and the right resources to make that happen. And right now, it's just kind of like a suggestion by two students at McMaster. But um, I feel like if we kind of spread the word and, and spread our, our project and what we've been doing and our ideas, Possibly we can influence someone, someone with authority, someone with power, or if we get more people involved and more people behind this, um, a bigger voice will lead to a bigger influence as well. So another thing just to go along with that is um, there are examples of the rooftop being used as green space before. So in May of 1994, um, a local botanist had well, been convinced by Yale Properties to continue to attract people to the roof because it was like faltering at that point. Um, she planted like a bunch of flowers in like various different like potting areas on top of the roof. It was reported that like its success like lasted um, like initially from like, during the summer months, so from June to September, like, to September after it was being implemented. But unfortunately, like, like like with seasonal change and also like with the ability to not keep a constant amount of people like up there, the project really quickly failed. So yes, like these green like situations work. But it's also like about like being able to constantly attract like people and bring them up there for them to continue to work. So I think we also need to take part in that. Are there any more questions? Yes, you. <laughs>
Thank you, Lucas. That was a, a great presentation. It was very, very practical, and I know a little bit about that uh, mall and the history and the potential future for it. And I think you touched on all the all the highlights. It was fantastic. Two questions. Were you able to sit down with Yale and talk about the economics of uh, making this possible, what the barriers are, and what the economic um, conditions need to be to, to, to realize all of these ideas, to take pipe dream to reality? And have you, the second question, what are the barriers to making all of this happen? The practical barriers? Yeah, that's a very loaded question there. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, we did not get to have a lot of time with the um, with property managers. They are kind of very disclosed in their own office within the space. Although I did talk to the female, uh, I, I forget the name, it's unfortunate, um, who is the manager of Jackson Square um, for about like 30 seconds, very briefly. Um, basically, what I was told was that Jackson Square is changing and it is like, re like revitalizing and that like, she's working towards fostering a sense of community. It was very much um, like a doctor saying, of like what I was being given. It was kind of just like, oh, Jackson Square is changing, everything's great, bye. <laughs> um, there are a lot of, um, of issues to like working in this work. Um, unfortunately, what we've learned in our research process is that you cannot have one simple plan and apply it. Um, and that like, urban renewal is not just uh, like something that you can just easily like sign off on like, on a written page and move forward. It is a system. Um, so not only like, can, like do we need to bring people, but we also need to attract commercial investment as well. Um, and there needs to be a certain balance between like a sense of community for people to come in order to invest in like into like the commercial uh, like sense. And once again, like, there's also like a, a various architectural like, issues like, within the space that need to be corrected before that can happen. So um, I think there's multiple hurdles. And to sum it up for you. I would say one is um, the brutalist architecture which was used. Uh, two, the inability to track the critical mass and constant flow of people. Um, and three, um, the inability to uh, attract consistent like, capital investment because there has been, but it isn't last. So thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much.